Hi, welcome to my power talk. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with me and uh, some technical difficulties. So we've already established we're going to do it in English. <laughs> Ten years of Roscon. What? Um, yeah, feels like yesterday when Scott sat next to me and he was like, so you're coming to Froscon, and I was like, ah, I gotta learn, blah, blah, have exams, blah, blah. And he spoke the magical words that every nerd wants to hear. We are gonna have a bouncy castle. So, 10 years later, <laughs> here I am, I think it's like my fifth Froscon, maybe six. I still think that the bouncy castle is the most brilliant marketing uh, stunt of all times. Thank you. Finally. <laughs> okay. Ah. <laughs> okay, I should have gone with the PDF. I do have it. <laughs> All things fail. So why am I here? Um, I want to tell you about something that uh, my company does. It's called Open Friday. And it's uh, pretty neat. It's uh, how we spread knowledge in the company. So I consider us a learning organization mainly because of that Open Friday thing. Um, it replaces a lot of our meetings. Um, it's how we uh, come up with new ideas. And yeah, it's a really cool thing. Yeah. I see exactly the same that thing that you do. Um, yeah. And I want to talk about the general history of what we've tried before until we came up with that thing. And um, just to give you a little bit of context, I work at Zipgate. We have an office in Dusseldorf, and we're all co-located. So just so in that in the end you know how your situation will vary from ours. So we are all in the same place. That makes it much easier, many things. Uh, we are uh, 120 people. When the story starts, in 2010, we were 60, 65-ish. And the split, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and when we came up with Open Friday, we weren't even trying to solve all the benefits that we're getting here. So that was pretty neat. So we'll do that. Oh, we do, uh, we're a telephony provider. And we've got about five products, and we build all of it on our own. Because we have this philosophy, if you haven't built it, then you can't change stuff, and then you will only be able to offer what everyone else offers, because everybody both, uh, buys the same black box. So we have a lot of front end and uh, interfaces and the telephony back end that we all build ourselves. And the ratio between the people who built the actual product and the supporting people like legal and accounting and uh, customer support, the split has always been half. So even when we grew, about half of people are developers. So why 2010? So for once, I joined the company in 2010. Um, and we started doing Scrum shortly thereafter, which is kind of a break. And we started doing Open Friday about 2012, so we've done it for three years, and we're still pretty happy. So, what was it like in the olden days? We started Scrum without anybody in the company ever having done it before. So all the knowledge that we had was book knowledge, um, and we had the usual silo. So we had a, a web front, a web team that was in one room, and we had the backend team in one room, and the middleware team in one room, and we started to mix those teams up into cross-functional teams. We trained each team one after the other, and then we just went our merry scrum ways. Hello? So in the beginning, it worked fabulously for us. It's beyond comparison. So we had like uh, six project managers who became product owners uh, when we did the switch to Scrum. And before they were work, uh, walking around, trying to keep up what people are actually doing, uh, loads of the times uh, developers would just run, would just be waiting for somebody else, for some handoff. So there was a lot of time in between in the systems, waiting times. And once we did the switch, 
uh, those six product owners could barely keep up with the demand. So it was actually a lot of times that teams would, there wouldn't be enough backlog for all of us. So we all had the same backlog. We, we all pulled, all five teams pulled from the same backlog. And sometimes there just weren't enough prepared stories. And then in the middle of the sprint, it was like, yeah, well, we are kind of done here. Um, now what? Yeah. I'll switch to the PDF. I don't think this is going anywhere. Okay, what have I done now? Ah, okay. Hello. Oh, well, that's just <laughs> as well. I swear, I came prepared. Can you find her anywhere? Ah, okay. That's the one. <laughs> the fuck is that? <laughs> oh, and it's all on camera. That's uh, as well. Ah, finally. Yeah, so Scrum was working great for us. Uh, and to quote my boss, so before Scrum, we had so many ideas. And we never got around to doing them. And uh, we thought we needed twice as many developers. And now with Scrum, we can barely think of enough things to do so that all the teams have enough work. So quite the switch. But it came at a price. So at, uh, in 2011, we were all slightly fatigued. We had also accumulated some technical debt. So it's not supposed to happen, but it happened anyway. And we already had quite a bit of legacy code. So not ideal. And I feel like we were in a hamster wheel. So there was a sprint, and then there was the next sprint, and the next sprint, and the next sprint. And there was nothing on the horizon to ever relieve that. It led to quite a bit of problems that uh, back then, I was a Scrum Master. So developers approached us. And um, one thing that came to a halt was uh, we're actually a very helpful company and very, very friendly. But in Scrum, every team had the commitment to their own team. And of course, they wanted to make that commitment. They didn't want to let the people immediately around them down. Uh, so that we were all more reluctant to help somebody else. And you needed that. Because in the old ways, one year ago, there was a one-to-one -one relationship between a developer and a system. So you were a developer, OK, you maintained that demon. So when you wanted to, but now we had the sh a shared code base. And you often needed help. If you wanted to do something in that daemon, you often had like zero knowledge. Of course, there was no documentation. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, so that was a bit of a problem. Um, and because we had that shared code base, we often needed to come to a consensus about how we were going to run things. There was no CTO, no technical team lead, nobody who could have just taken that decision. So we, with like 20, later 30 people, we needed to figure things out for ourselves, how we were going to do that. And back then, well, that was all new. So it was much harder. Nowadays, we can do that with 30 people quite fast. Back then? Not so much, and we didn't really have time to all meet, to have like an all deaf hands meeting. Um, historically, Zipgate is a very innovative company, so we, we were the first one with several things in Germany at least. But that often uh, resulted from developers having downtime, and we're like, oh, I'm just gonna dabble here, and if you don't have that downtime anymore, yeah, then you have less innovation. And that also became a problem. 
no new technologies, people becoming cranky because they never got to play with something new. Oh yeah, and uh, here's the, the ugliest, I think. We still had loads of manual maintenance. So we had servers that would just run occasionally full and somebody would have to go and manually purge them. I'm a bit ashamed to say that we had lots of those places. So just, I think by the book you would have said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna clean this up, but it would have halted everything for a couple of, well, at least weeks to automate all these things. And we, frankly, we, we weren't back, we weren't willing to do that. So we needed to come up with another way. Uh, and uh, just for the record, we cleaned up most of these things. So bit by bit by bit. And I think right now we have one thing where people have to manually like go and uh, I'm gonna drop, uh, delete, not drop, never drop. <laughs> I'm gonna delete those things. Um, so just to summarize, that was just not a sustainable pace, which is actually what you were supposed to do. And the solution that we uh, came up with was Slack time. So if you don't know, Slack is when you deliberately do not plan all of your time 100%, but you leave unplanned chunks in it so that if something comes up, like all of the previously mentioned things, you have time to react and time to do them. And well, what is a Scrum Master team to do? We hit research mode and we looked at what do other people do to introduce Slack. Obvious one is that you take some sort of break between the sprint end and the sprint beginning. There is my cone described as six times two plus one, but you have two week sprints. We had two week sprints, by the way, too. So um, you sprint for six two week sprints and then you have one slack week, which kind of has the smell of a tidying up and making ready for production. Smell to it. Google has popularized the Developers Friday. So where every Friday you are free to work on your side project. They have a very heavy focus on that you're supposed to do an actual project. And many Google products came out of that, like uh, Orkut, back in the day, social media, way before Facebook, um, and uh, Google Mail, as far as I know, also one of those pet side projects. Gold cards are a mechanism from, uh, I think, Rachel Davis described it for an XP team, where at the beginning of the sprint, every uh, person on the team gets a token, this gold card, and you can, um, you can, I um, lose. You, well, you basically, you get one day off per sprint when you hand in your token, and then you're free for that day to work on whatever you want. Um, FedEx did a quarterly thing. I think nowadays you would call it a hackathon, but back then hackathon wasn't a word that existed, I think. Uh, so FedEx day was once per quarter, so every three months you get two days and you really intensely build like a feature or something, complete feature with different teams. So every team has their own feature that they can work on. And in the end, we picked the uh, one day break between the end and the beginning because we had a couple of constraints. So go cards didn't work for us because we wanted everybody to have that time at the same time so that you knew you could ask other people. We had a number of really nasty problems that you needed like three or four people and the right ones to come together to solve this. So same time. Uh, and we knew we wanted it often rather than just a few times. So this one. And um, some of you might think, okay, what did management say to that? Kind of a non-problem because they were already, um, they liked the Developers Friday idea of Google. What they didn't like about it was the pressure of having to come up with a dedicated project that you work on. So they thought that it was a lot of, expectation, a lot of pressure attached to that. They didn't want that. Okay, so we didn't do that. So that was easy. We got that day. So out of 10 working days, you have nine sprint days left. Uh, the bad thing about it is that they, 
had like a couple of conditions, so they weren't convinced that everybody would use the time wisely. Um, so what we came up with was the NDS. NDS is kind of a random name. It's uh, nach dem Sprint, uh, after the sprint. We tried to pick a name as random as possible and not to, for example, call it like maintenance Thursday or something, because that would limit what people would think what they can do uh, on that day. And we wanted to keep it as open as possible. Like you could do the maintenance that you, that would, I mean, the, when we did not purge some of those things that actually affected customers, then suddenly you couldn't sign up for a new account or something like that. It was really bad. Uh, you could also do pet projects, this whole tech innovation thing. You could do research, um, help other teams. And we also did impediment meetings. So this whole consensus thing, when you have to figure out something, I don't know, coding styles or are we going to use Mokito or something else? Stuff like that. Mm. And the way we did it, we met in the morning in a circle. That was meant for people to team up. So everybody would say what they were going to work on, so to potentially find other people that would want to work on the same thing. People would work, and then in the afternoon we would meet again, uh, go around again, how far have people come, have they finished something, did they ship? Um, and we had a spreadsheet to keep track. So that was supposed to be a reference for others so that you could, hey, wait a minute, didn't somebody already look into what was popular then? I don't know, Moo Tools. Um, and then they could just uh, search in that spreadsheet. Or also for yourself so that you would remember two weeks after where you had left off the previous NES. And then there was cake, really, truly. Yeah, and it kind of tanked, so we framed it as a surprise. And I mean, we honestly thought we were solving uh, our developers' problems. Uh, most of the Scrum Masters were actually Scrum Masters. So we had a, we had a, we only had part-time Scrum Masters then. So uh, either Dev and Scrum Master, or in my case, User Experience and Scrum Master. Not a good idea, I cannot recommend a split pro. Um, yeah, but back to the origin, to the uh, disaster. So we came up with this great idea together with the sea level. And then we sprung it on people and they weren't happy. I mean, you know, I didn't know. I mean, we tried to do the right thing here. So today when I tell that, it's completely clear to me that this had to tank because we didn't really consult the people who were affected. And actually now, they would just decide it themselves. They would come up with something themselves. Uh, but back then, we were honestly, the, the backlash was a surprise. We, were, we give you a day, hello. Um, but I think uh, the real underlying problem is that it was a trust issue, that the C-level didn't really trust the developers and that the developers had a very fine antenna for that. So that this uh, morning circle, um, yeah, we had a perfectly good reason, people to team up, but that was not where the idea originated. It was actually to hold people accountable, to not just go off their merry ways. Um, and the spreadsheet also, so that people would not just idle the whole day and do nothing. It was, and people felt that. They felt micromanaged and they failed, uh, uh, felt surveilled. And um, yeah, that made everything harder. <coughs> a couple of the problems, we did a two months trial. That's how we started. So we're gonna try this for two months. So effectively we'll have four NDSs and then we'll take, uh, take the toll and see what happens. Uh, some of the problems that we had were that people um, worked alone. Uh, we did lots of starting and rarely finished anything. But we still had unapproved launches. So kind of you would think, yeah, you can do both. Uh, you can launch barely finished things where nobody has ever thought through the implications of the lifetime cost of that. Um, and often 
you could feel that when people in that round, that they had just come up with what they were going to do. So it was ad hoc. It was barely thought out. Uh, all not nice. So after the two months, well, the first try didn't work. So we introduced new and more rules to solve the problem. Uh, you can take a guess how that worked out. Um, the new rules that we came up with were that you were supposed to phrase your uh, plans as a story so that it has the so that component so that you know why are you actually doing that. Uh, and you had it uh, to hand it in one day prior to NES so that it would be more thought out. And we required pairing because, for example, this is one of those rules who mainly targeted like one person, but instead of going to that one person saying, don't do that, it's bad. We uh, made up a rule for everybody that, um, that you were supposed to work in pairs so that at least two people would think it was valuable what you're doing. Surprisingly, <laughs> that didn't make it better. Still miffed about that. Um, and to my, uh, to my shame, we just went like that. We had gone through a lot of change. We were kind of weary of all that change. And we didn't have a better idea, and it solved some of our problems. So we just let it slide. I think somewhere around that time I left the company, and I rejoined later. And then in 2012, Okay, uh, to uh, rephrase, uh, to pull the camera out. So, is this a solution for everybody, um, or did the mistakes that we make actually help from the management that we have today? Um, both, <laughs> kind of both. So, uh, every mistake that we've made, and we've made lots, still it helps us get where we are today. So, the longer I do this whole agile and transition and change thing, the more I'm convinced that you, I used to be really impatient and I was like, ah, oh, why can't everybody, I think it's so clear and why can't everybody see that? And to be honest, half of the time I was wrong. Um, you can't really accelerate it. You can accelerate it somewhat, but people have to make a lot of mistakes and see a lot of the things that they think are supposed to work and then don't. Because otherwise you're always bitching and saying, ah, I think we should do it like that because well, you've never seen it, and you're convinced it's going to work. But it won't. But you will only be able to see that when you see it. So uh, I think the more important thing is uh, being open to that. Yeah, you're going to do a lot of mistakes. But the mechanism, so Open Friday, is also something that I think will help considerably if you have a certain parameters in. So lack of trust doesn't help, but I'll come to that later. Trust builds up over time, so, and it's hard to accelerate that. There are ways, but it's difficult. So it's like with friendships. You often, you just need time, time spent together. Um, so in 2012, our savior arrives. Actually, he doesn't arrive. He comes back. He comes back from a, a bar camp. Uh, this is Stefan. He was a developer back then, now he's a product owner. And one of his uh, best characteristics is that he is very excitable and that he's very, very, it's contagious. So it's not like you're like, oh, Stefan, yeah, sure, it's, I'm sure it's great. But it's like, yeah, that sounds really great and I want to do it because he presents it in a way that's so catching. And he was at that bar camp, his first one, and I think for anyone in the company. And they had this thing called open space, and he was completely psyched. So, what is open space? Who of you know open space? Okay, thanks. So, ju just uh, not that many. Uh, open space uh, technology enables a participant-driven gathering. 
and you don't have a, so usually you come to a conference like CrossCon and you have an agenda already. Somebody thought, yeah, we're going to take this talk and we're not going to take this talk. And in an open space, you just come, you have no idea what's going to happen because people pitch sessions then and there. So it's really participant driven. The inventor of open space came up with the idea because he noticed that he and uh, many other people, what they liked most about a conference were actually the coffee breaks and the evenings. So where they got to talk to the other participants because these people also had a lot of knowledge, not only the speakers. And he thought of a way to maximize that time, the uh, informal discussions. And this is how you do it. So in the morning, or whenever you start, you can also, of course, do it in, an even, in the evening. Uh, the facilitator starts the theme, uh, states the theme, and introduces the principles and the law. The principles are whoever comes are the right people. You don't need the CEO in your session to come up with something. Uh, and whenever it starts, it's the right time. So you're not confined by the slots. They are an orientation. But if it runs over, it runs over. Wherever it happens is the right place. You don't have to go into a room like this one. You can also do it in the launch or outside on the grass if you want to. Whatever happens is the only thing that could have happened. No regrets. And when it's over, it's over. So if, it's, if the discussion runs dry after half an hour and it's supposed to be an hour, you're not going to sit around for the last half an hour. And the law, so those were the principles. This is the law of two feet. If you join a session and then you feel like you're not contributing and you don't learn anything either, then you just leave. That's why it's called open. All the doors are supposed to be open. We usually don't do it because of noise, but yeah, you can just enter at any time and leave at any time. And people actually do that. And, it's, and that is a good thing. Um, so back to the morning session. After the facilitator has introduced the theme, uh, the participants introduce the topics and choose slots. So for example, you will have a grid like structure with the rooms and the times, and then you have your big sticky note. Write your name on it, that's important. And then you're like, I'm going to do Git for Beginners. And I'm going to do it at 1 p.m. in room B. Put it there, next one. We have a rule that if you pitch several sessions, you have to get back in line. Because some people would pitch like three sessions in a row, pick all the good times. And this is, uh, this is what it uh, looked like, it looks like it's two months ago. So there's a lot of people, I'm guessing 70. And this is Aline pitching the actual Git for Beginners session. And that was uh, meant for people who are not developers, because we are trying to get more people to commit for uh, like uh, client support with wording or uh, the uh, user experience people and the designers with CSS weeks. And then you have the actual sessions. So at the time and space, you all, everybody who is interested in that particular topic, you meet up. And the session sponsor, that's the person who pitched the session, they have to take notes so that there is some, uh, some sort of record. Uh, internally, we use Yammer. It's kind of like Twitter just for your company. And we always post the notes there, or sometimes just a photo. But notes are better because they are searchable. And it, uh, so the opening round is at 10, and the closing round is at uh, 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And then you go around and give summaries of all the sessions. So you just go along uh, the board. And it happens a couple of times, because it's Friday, uh, that the session sponsor isn't there anymore, so somebody else has to do the summary, but that works too. And the way we started is that Stefan came back psyched, and he wrote an email to everyone here like, let's try this. Uh, this is going to be great. And about he pitched it for one afternoon. They started at uh, 1 p.m., went till 4 p.m., 
and about 20 people showed up. That was half of all the people who developed product. And his uh, summary email was too long to read. And yes, with open space was great. We'll do that again. Everybody should come next time. More cake. Uh, the everybody here is the key, because the NDS was just for developers, but Open Friday is for everyone, and I really mean everyone. And since then, we've done that every other Friday, all day, from 10 to 4, and all the company. This works mostly. The big problem that we have is client support, because we've got a hotline, and somebody's got to staff the hotline. So. These guys have to take turns. They can't make it every time, so they will come every four weeks or every six weeks, depending on schedule. But apart from that, so accounting, legal, everybody. Even kitchen personnel, if they're so inclined. We do, we have a restaurant. Um, I brought you one example of the uh, sessions that we do have. So on this particular day, we had, this is actually a slow day, so we found out that it's a wave pattern. We'll have one open Friday with lots of sessions, open Friday with few sessions, lots of sessions, few sessions. This is a few session Friday. Um, and we had a fraud prevention, so there's quite a lot of telephone fraud going on and we want to protect ourselves and our customers. Uh, we have a pattern library, which is a thing that you can do to the new websites that have a um, coherent look across products very fast. We did a retrospective on that because it's not just one team and it's easier to gather everyone on Open Friday. Um, some accounting stuff. Uh, lunch at Zipgate is we invite people for lunch. Um, we might have, no, it was already underway. So probably also some sort of retrospective. Uh, customer communication, how could we do that better? And my colleague rehearsed his IPv6 talk, and I also rehearsed this talk on an open Friday. The Git for Beginners, and the Scrum Masters every time um, introduce some sort of phrase that is making the rounds, and here they uh, explain team phases. So the norming, storming, forming thing. So, to me, and to everybody I've ever spoken with, Open Friday works great. So why does this work and NES did not work? Like I already said, it's for everybody. It makes a huge difference uh, when all these different departments, and it's not like we have walled up silos. We are already, uh, even before Open Friday, we work quite open, but it still makes a difference uh, that you know that everybody is available no boundaries, and it turns out a lot of people are interested in things beyond their department, and that really helps. And a lot of the supporting people, they need stuff that uh, typically only a developer can fix, and that also helps a lot. Um, open space is a matchmaker between the people who are, uh, whoever is in topic of interest, and to bring all those people together. It allows for multiple touch, uh, touch points during the day. Uh, with the NDS, we had this big round in the, uh, in the morning, and you had to come up with something for the whole day. Now you don't have to do that, but you can take part in several sessions. And if you do every single session, so last Open Friday, I actually had five sessions, and they were all really engaging. I was really beat at the end. It was a really good Open Friday, but it was really uh, exhausting when you're that engaged. Um, and of course, the board uh, allows, uh, is an information radiator. So you can come back and you're like, ah, it's, uh, so it's uh, five to two, the next uh, slot is gonna start soon, so what, what could I go look at? Or what could I could contribute? What am I interested in? Um, this time around, we actually have a record, so that the spreadsheet never really worked for tracking, and a spreadsheet is not a nice format to search something in. So this works much better. And because it's genuinely, we don't do the record uh, to, to keep track of people,
but to keep track of a topic and to keep track of what have we already decided or what ideas have we already had. So the motivation behind it is very different. So it's, uh, that's actually working great. And it works because we have a lot more trust than we used to have. And that was just something that built up. So C-level trusts everybody else much more to do what they think is best for the company. That's actually how we, how we pitch it. This is, you don't have to go to Open Friday because you will still have the Slack day and you can do whatever you want. And for example, there will be people who pitch, uh, I'm going to work on that um, new uh, XMMP, XMPP uh, thing, um, and you can come join me. I'm going to do that all day, and I'm going to pitch that in the morning. You don't have to take part. It's completely optional. Um, and we pitch it like, this is the day where you can do what you think is best for the company. What is the best use of your time? Um, and uh, in turn, uh, everybody else has come to trust the motivation, the, uh, the motivation of everybody else much more, also of the higher ups. So they are doing this because blah, blah, blah. No. So good intentions, just as your first go to thought. Um, the benefits that we reap from Open Friday are uh, all of the original benefits that we, all of the problems that we try to solve with the NDS in the first, uh, on the first end. Um, so we get to do maintenance, it's just not that much anymore. Uh, we get to do pet projects, can do research, cross team help, really not that much of a problem because in the meantime, we also have a, enough slack during the sprints to do that. It's actually not a problem anymore. But it helps to have a dedicated, it was, ah, we're just going to do it on Open Friday. We're going to do a session. Um, and impediment meetings, we also don't have, or maybe we have them, we just think of them differently and we don't call them that anymore because, well, most of the time when you have a problem, you can just do an Open Friday slot and it's gone fully fast and things don't have to fester around for a month or two until everybody's really angry. And then it has a couple of benefits that we never foresaw because we, we just tried open space and we saw all the things that, uh, all the good that came of it, but we, we didn't really try to get that. It was just like, whoa, that's pretty cool. We guess we'll keep doing that. Um, we used to do have a couple of, uh, of meetings to sync up. For example, we had a, a product on our Wunsch concert. Uh, so I really don't have a translation for that. So um, you can just come and dump whatever feature wish you have. Um, and there was another day where the POs would have slots um, where they would invite developers to talk about certain topics because you knew when you do the billing, you have to talk to that person specifically. That's like the minimum requirement for this discussion to make sense. Um, and it really broke the sprint apart with all these several, and you had to keep track of them. And, <laughs> and if you wanted to have a cross-team meeting, that was with like six people, you would have to reschedule forever until you found a slot where everybody could actually make it. And then somebody would still not show up, was really crucial. So all that is gone. You know everybody's going to have time on Open Friday, so you just do it then. And because it's optional, everybody who is there. So if I do an Open Friday slot and I think this really doesn't make sense without Bob, then I'll go to Bob before and say like, hey, I'm going to do this Open Friday session. Will you come if I do it? Because, yeah, you're kind of crucial here. And um, so that's something that you can do, but you cannot mandate anybody to come. So it's got a completely different energy than a meeting. And a meeting is like, oh, I don't want to be here. Why do I have, I don't even have to be here. I can't blah. But uh, in a session, it's completely different. If I'm like, oh, what am I doing here? I just get up and leave. And uh, other people might come. And that sometimes means that sessions are very small. But still, you can be sure that everybody who is there wants to be there. So the contribution level is completely different. And it's usually you get all the people that you need. 
and it's across departments, with it, which is a huge cross-pollination factor. So, for example, this is the fraud prevention session, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is a guy from accounting. And I think in the olden days, that would have been a really dreaded meeting with about five people. And wow, what a surprise. All these people are actually uh, interested in how we prevent fraud. And they are from all kinds of departments. Um, another thing that we do a lot is knowledge transfer. Uh, this is, I think, hugely beneficial because it means that if somebody in our company learns something, like uh, a team did a design sprint, that's some well, a technique that you can use to come up with, a, with for example, a landing page very quickly and uh, prototype it and test it rapidly. And after that, they will do an open Friday session with all the things that they've learned. So introducing, hey, actually, there's this thing called a design sprint. And we did it this way, and this is what we learned. So the whole company gets to, I call it leveling up. Also, the developer things. I looked at Java 8 and how we could uh, how we could integrate that here. So stuff like that. Everybody gets to learn. This is a knowledge transfer session. I think uh, you know how you can port your mobile phone number to a new provider. Uh, there's a new system, and he he's a developer, and he told everybody in customer support, or at least a couple of people in customer support, about how this is going to work way before they actually have to do it. So some ramp up. And last but not least, it gives you a bias for action. So just sitting on your desk like, yeah, that's nothing I can do. It's just the way things work. No, they're not. If you don't like what's happening, if you don't, then for f Pete's sake, do uh, an open Friday session and change it. And sometimes you will find out that you're the only one who thinks that is a problem. And that is valuable too, because then you'll probably shut up about it and stop making people spreading negativity about something that is a non-issue for everybody but you. And um, there's this saying, everybody should be a leader, so you don't need that much leadership if everybody takes leadership in a certain situation. And with Open Friday, you've got the opportunity to practice that. Because I think one of the abilities that you will need is stand in front of a, pe a room full of people and pitch your uh, slot and make people interested in that. And then maybe you even have to guide the discussion a bit. And people uh, do that, so that worked out pretty nicely. And if it wasn't completely obvious by now, we uh, do have a lot of fun on it. It's a very high energy day. Um, in the week, in the Open Friday week, uh, usually people look, uh, look forward to Open Friday. And it's not like our usual work days are a misery. It's just that Open Friday is even cooler. And people often have sessions in advance that they have already planned, and they're like, ah, oh, I'm so going to pitch that, and it's going to be awesome. So to wrap it up, uh, if you've got a problem, the solution is usually just one Open Friday away. Um, that's pretty cool. Well, question is, what would you or your company be willing to invest, given that I've convinced you that this is a great idea to try? So we used 10% and we were lucky that we already had a Slack day lying around underutilized, under, well, it was underwhelming, could have been better. So we could take this. But there's no reason why you can't just start small, just the way that Stefan did. Just do the one afternoon thing. All you need is a whiteboard and the stickies, and, well, some rooms probably, or at least one room. You could have a single track open space. Uh, and people who are genuinely willing to try that and just see how the atmosphere changes. Yeah, I've um, made a one-pager about that. Um, I will also link to the stickies. So that is in one page. What is an open space? How does it work? 
So this is something that you could just uh, spread in your company so that people already know how it's going to work. And that's it. Thank you. Are there questions? We've got nine minutes for questions. Okay, you go. Okay, uh, why is it the Friday? Bless you. Um, the NDS wasn't a Friday. It was a Thursday because we had the sprint change in the middle of the week. When we started, we thought it would be neat to do it on a Wednesday. Um, I think the original reasoning was that we want to launch stuff the day before, and you don't want to launch so many things on the Friday. Nowadays, we just launch every day, small stuff, so we don't have that constraint anymore. And uh, in the beginning, also, all the teams were synchronized. And now we have uh, teams that do two-week sprints, and they, already, they always end on the Thursday before uh, Open Friday. And we've got one one-week sprints. Uh, a four-week, a four-day uh, four sprint is really hard, by the way, so I'm not sure about that. Um, it's just that the Friday is usually the marker of it's the end of the week. And to be, uh, to be quite honest, I think that in most companies, the Friday is kind of less uh, busy, yeah, and you get less done <laughs> on a Friday because you're like, it's nearly the weekend. And it's a way to really make a lot out of a day that's usually like really quiet. But, I think you missed the beginning of the talk um, because I. Uh, so the question is, um, might that not be bad for productivity because uh, you uh, look forward to that Friday and you you don't like what you do the rest of the week and you're like just waiting and wouldn't it be better to have like 10% that you can spend any any time you want? The reason we don't do this and why I wouldn't recommend it, but it depends on what problem you want to solve or what benefits you want to gain, is um, that we want everybody to be available at the same time. So it's not just so that you can do stuff, but usually, at least in our company, if you want to do stuff, 90% of the time you're going to need other people to do it. You need buy-in, you need information, and it's um, huge. So it's typically not a pet project. It happens, and then people do it all day, but most of the times it's uh, discussing things, uh, starting an initiative. I think we should really be doing that. Um, and then maybe uh, the open Friday after that, you just code it, whatever you came up with, but you want the input of the other people so that you don't, we have an internal help desk. You don't want to code something that nobody is going to use and that everybody's going to hate. Um, as for productivity, our usual work week is not that bad. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, so uh, I don't hate what I'm doing most of the time. Um, so that's, I think that's true for 95% of the people. So that's really okay. And uh, not really what you asked for, but about productivity. I don't believe in busy people. So in a lot of companies, it seems like it's really important to busy. To be busy and uh, to do, I don't know, to be callable at 10 by a client. And I, okay, I would just, no, <laughs> that's my time. 10 p.m. in the evening is, uh, so I don't believe in busy, I believe in results. And the day that we invest is from the outside, I don't know if you can see it, but all the stuff that we don't do because we don't go down the wrong road, because we've talked to people before and we know what they kind of want. Um, that saves a lot of time. And then you don't have to be busy all the time. Because, yeah, you, 
you're doing a pretty good first first attempt anyway, and you can save a lot of work. There was one other, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, how much preparation do you do before a session? That completely <laughs> that completely depends. Uh, on what kind of session. So sometimes it's just like, I want to talk about that, and I'm just going there. Um, but last, last Open Friday, I did a slot. I came back from a conference, from Agile, um, and I had a, a lot of games that we played there, so exercises, games to prepare you, in this case, for conflict resolution. And I did prepare, uh, I needed color swatches, so I did those at home because I have a lot of colors and it took like 15 minutes. Um, I printed out stuff. So let's say I spent about an hour for a session that then went an hour. But because I had just been at the conference, I didn't need to prepare that much. Um, I know people, it really depends. If you're doing a workshop and you want everybody else to get a lot of value out of it, and you've got the time in the sprint, so it's not something that you just do, it's like I've got this open Friday session plan, but if the question is, is there sometimes additional time? Yes, but I think that's about 10% of sessions, and 90% of sessions is just like, I want to talk about that, or I'm going to do the research then and there. So this is the time that I take to invest the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what did uh, C-level or senior management do to for the progression? So at first they influenced the rules of the very first NES, which I've established tanked um, because of this whole. I think the underlying thing is the trust issue, and the. Um, then they, they were a major, major driver of uh, adjusting the rules and making it even worse, even more uh, surveillance. Um, but they did give us the Slack day. And they did not stand in anybody's way for, uh, for introducing the open space. So this was just something that Stefan kind of did. I'm guessing he asked, he's been with the company very long. So the longer you are with the company, the more you know the sea level. Um, and the, the, there's this anecdote. There was this guy in an open Friday session. And I was like, yeah, I've never even seen the bosses. I could, I, w I wouldn't recognize them. And the guy next to him was like, ah, oh, that's not that bad. And that was the boss. It was, that's okay. <laughs> never mind. Um, when I joined in 2010, January was traditionally the boss was on holiday and it was really slow because People knew he would take back decisions and change their decisions. So they all just did half-assed work. Nowadays, uh, he's on parental leave for... I haven't seen him in a while, and that's okay because everybody's just happily scrumming away and working. So it really changed how dependent we are and how many decisions they take. We're pretty self-organized, and we just take decisions. We've got two bosses, but one is more present than the other. Yeah, um, yeah. and I really need to leave because there's probably someone after me. Sorry. So, thank you. Mm -hmm.